In this lesson, we'll be examining the demographic transition model and its application to the study of population issues. The demographic transition model lets us examine the demographics of a particular location and allows us to make certain assumptions about how those populations will evolve over time. And in order to study this concept, we'll be answering the following three questions today. One, what is the demographic transition model? Two, what are the five stages of the demographic transition model? And three, what are some of the limitations of the demographic transition model? Now, since the Industrial Revolution, a pattern of progress has been observed as countries develop. And the demographic transition model tries to describe this trend. The demographic transition model refers to the trend where populations move away from unstable populations with high birth and death rates towards stable populations with low birth and death rates. And in this model, countries move through stages as they develop. As they move through these stages, their birth rates and death rates are impacted, and thus their population growth rates change. And this is the observation that we're making, the key one. Now, not all countries develop at the same rate. So if we were to look today at all the different countries throughout the world, we would find countries at various stages in demographic transition. And it does it, this is on a predictive model where it tells us one stage takes X number of years, the next stage takes Y number of years, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's describing a pattern that tends to happen. There tends to be this line of progress from one stage through to the next, but it can take a different amount of time from country to country based on a variety of circumstances. And this graph here is showing the relationship that the demographic transition model is trying to describe. Uh, the relationship between birth rates, death rates, and total population growth. Now this is a generalization. Obviously the particular circumstances of a country will impact exactly how quickly these rates rise and fall how long it takes to move from one stage to another, and any anomalies or detours that might arise along the way. On the average, however, this is the pattern that we tend to see. Now, in order to describe the evolution of populations over time, we break the model up into five distinct stages. In stage one, we have high birth rates and high death rates. And there is also a very low life expectancy, especially to what we're accustomed to uh, in the modern day in the developed world. Because of the high birth and death rates, population is stable or very slowly increasing. The number of births in a given year is roughly even to the number of deaths. And there are a lot of births and a lot of deaths. Now, there are many reasons for why stage one societies tend to have higher birth rates. For one, these places have little to no access to contraception. In many cases, the technology has not advanced yet. There's not birth control pills or other such contraceptions available to people. Secondly, there's a high infant mortality rate. So you need to have lots of kids to ensure that some of them make it to adulthood. A woman might give birth to, let's say, eight children in her lifetime, but only two of them might survive into adulthood. Um, being confident that your kids will grow up to be adults is a very recent development in human history. Uh, this is the same reason that animals tend to give birth to several offspring at the same time. Uh, it's an evolutionary advantage. It ensures that at least some of your offspring will live long enough to procreate on their own and pass on their DNA. Um, it, it's fitness in evolutionary terms. Along with this... Um, High infant mortality rate, though, you also have a high risk of women dying during childbirth. So we can see here how there's kind of these two things going on at once where um, women are kind of incentivized to have many children to ensure that they'll have enough kids to survive into adulthood. Um, but that's also putting them at a greater risk. The more children they have, the more chances they have to die during childbirth, which was a lot more common in the past than it is today. Uh, a third reason why birth rates are tend to be a lot higher in stage one societies. Um, there's also the consideration of having someone to take care of you when you grow old. Remember, these are societies with very little development. There are no public institutions to support you. It's mostly your family and maybe your immediate community. So when you get old, there are no retirement homes or pensions for you to, to take care of yourself. You need to rely on family members to do that. So this is another incentive for families to have lots of kids. 
to you know have some people still alive in your role to take care of you. Now, no country is really in stage one of the demographic transition today. Um, it's more of a historical term. So if we are to look into history, a country like Great Britain or other uh, European countries before about uh, 1760, or kind of when we start to see the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. Before that time, we could probably describe them as a stage one society. And the only groups in society today that we might consider to be stage one are maybe some remote, isolated, indigenous communities that have had very little contact with the outside world. But really, we're talking about thousands of people here. We're not talking about a large percentage of the population. Almost every society in the modern age has moved past stage one of demographic transition. In stage two, this is when we start to see a population boom. Birth rates remain high, but death rates fall rapidly. This is because life expectancy is starting to increase. So people are still having lots of kids, but now most of them are surviving into adulthood. And now you can imagine, if they continue to have lots of kids when they grow up, um, the population can start to grow very, very, very rapidly. You have one generation, the next generation is even larger, the next generation is even larger. This is like exponential growth going on. And the increase in life expectancy is mostly due to the decrease in child mortality and fewer deaths from childbirth. Maximum lifespan might see a small increase, but not by much. Um, most of the life expectancy increase that we're seeing here is because just fewer people are dying such an early death, dying before they turn five years old. And so again, if we were to look at this historically, um, a country like Great Britain would have gone through this stage between about 1760 and 1830. And a country like the Democratic Republic of the Congo is in stage two today. This is an interesting stage of demographic transition because a rapidly growing population can start to put lots of stresses on a variety of aspects of society. It can put lots of stresses on the environment because now you have more and more people to provide for. That requires lots of resources. This can also put a strain on social institutions. You have lots of young people growing up at the same time looking for jobs. Um, and if they don't have jobs, that can, you know, lead to trouble. You can have lots of people wanting change. So many historians have noticed that at this stage, we tend to see a lot more social upheaval. Um, countries may experience revolutions during this stage. Uh, so for example, if we were to look at European countries, um, as many Western European countries went through this stage in the early 1800s, we saw two revolutionary waves in 1830 and 1848 throughout um, a variety of countries in Europe. And then as well, in 1917, there's the Russian Revolution, where the Soviets, the communists, come to power in Russia. Um, th at that stage, Russia would have been in stage two of demographic transition. So there's something to be said for this being a particularly dangerous stage in terms of um, you know, leading to revolution. There's a lot of social upheaval at this time. In stage three, we start to see those, we still see those low death rates, but now we start to see birth rates declining rapidly. Society has to deal with the issues of a growing population. And for a variety of reasons, we start to see those birth rates decline and we start to see changes in society. Population continues to grow, but at a much slower pace. And in this stage, we start to see improved access to healthcare and contraception and other um, institutions. We start to see the introduction of social welfare programs and child labor laws. Um, and again, these are in response to um, sort of, th we could argue these are in response to a lot of these social upheavals, the development of welfare programs and labor laws to handle those, those issues. So think of like the New Deal and other programs in response to the Great Depression. Um, so a country like Great Britain would have gone through this period from about 1830 to 1950. In, today, in today's society, we have countries like Algeria, Indonesia, Tunisia, and many others. In stage four, we see low birth rate and low death rate, meaning we have a pretty stable population. Population is staying more or less the same or maybe very slowly increasing. Um, in stage four, contraception is widely available and accepted, and you have many people who are choosing to have no children at all, and they now have that option. Um, people can go their whole lives and choose not to have children. 
There are very low infant mortality rates and long lifespans. Um, maximum lifespan may creep up a bit, but again, most of this is because of um, we have fewer, not only fewer um, infant mortalities and fewer women dying childbirth, but now our uh, social programs and our uh, med uh, healthcare system has improved to the point where we can pre uh, prevent more early deaths. So think of things like vaccines, which are now widely accepted. We have cancer treatments that are available to not only the very rich, but you might have um, healthcare programs which provide those to all citizens. Preventative healthcare for conditions like heart disease, the availability of insulin for diabetics, etc. There's all of these other factors going on which are preventing not only um, deaths in children, but, but many early deaths in general. And as a result, more and more people are living towards um, old age. You also start to see laws being put in place that do this as well. So think of things like workplace safety laws, uh, drinking and driving laws, mandating that people wear seatbelts. All of these things are helping to prevent premature deaths. And it's at this stage where we start to see a lot of those things put in place in these countries. And that's what's leading to sort of those life expectancies creeping up. It's not necessarily that people are living longer, um, the oldest people in society are living longer, it's that on average, more people are living into old age. And in this stage, um, again, we start to see advanced welfare states develop to support the sick, the vulnerable, the poor, and the elderly. And so examples of these countries would be Great Britain, Canada today, the United States today. Most developed countries today would fall into this stage, stage four. And finally, we have the fifth stage of demographic transition. This one wasn't originally included, um, but later on was added on because it sort of describes a trend that we've started to see in some of these stage four countries as they continue to develop. So in stage five, birth rates fall lower than the death rate, and this leads to a negative net natural increase, or in other words, a shrinking population. Now, an aging population could put a strain on economies. It's expensive to support a high dependency load. These are people who may be retired. More and more, a uh, higher, higher percentage of your population is retired. They need to be provided for in some way. This is fewer people working, fewer people who are paying taxes to support those social programs. So this can put a high strain on a society. Um, we can look at not only a strain on economies, though, but also social effects. So lots of the xenophobia and anti-immigrant rhetoric that we're seeing in Europe today, um, a lot of that can be uh, tied into this fear of losing your national identity. And we see this in a lot of rhetoric of these uh, far-right anti-immigrant politicians in Europe talking about how... Um, you know, Europeans are having fewer children and immigrants are having more children and they're going to take over one day. Um, this kind of language and fear is, you know, indicative of a stage five society. Your population is shrinking and in order to avoid those economic pitfalls, you need to rely on immigration in order to support your economy. And so we can see a lot of these fears playing out in Europe today. So some examples of stage five countries, we can look at a country like Russia. Um, Russia is actually kind of an interesting example because they didn't necessarily follow the demographic transition uh, model in a straight line. Uh, uh, at the collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 90s, they had what we might call a demographic collapse where people started to have way fewer children. And for a full two decades, um, Russia had a declining population. Um, this has been reversed to an extent. Since 2011, the trend is reversed. And at this point, Russia has a very, very small population increase. But it's very small. And again, we don't know whether or not this is a trend that's going to continue over time. We see this in countries like Japan and then in some Eastern European countries as well. A country like Greece would be a good example of one where this has put a heavy strain on their economy, where they have lots of welfare programs and you know, a really advanced social state. Um, but not as many people who can pay into it anymore because they have uh, an aging population and a shrinking population and fewer people who can work to support those programs. There's been a variety of responses in these stage five societies. We talked about those anti-immigrant sentiments, but in some cases we've seen um, kind of incentives for you know people to have more children. You saw this in Russia. Um, there were in, in, in Quebec, this was something that happened too. 
Um, so there were policies put in place in Quebec for, you know, you would get a baby bonus if you had children. Um, again, trying to stave off of this uh, shrinking population, trying to continue um, your population growth, trying to avoid losing population over time. And so here, uh, these five graphs here are called population pyramids. And we can see their shape changes depending on where you are in the stages of demographic transition. They each have their own distinct shape. Now, that's not to say the model is perfect. The demographic transition model is good for predicting how countries in lower stages will develop based on the historic development of more advanced countries, but it's not great for predicting high HDI countries. Uh, for example, there's some evidence that um, very highly developed countries, countries with an HDI score of 0.9 or greater, once you kind of reach up into that range, the trend actually reverses and we start to see higher fertility rates. Um, you know, and this, again, kind of makes sense. If you, one of the reasons why people want to have fewer kids is because it's expensive to have lots of kids. You want to provide a high quality of life for your kids. And the more kids you have, the bigger financial strain that is on you. If you live in a country where resources are plentiful and, you know, everyone's rich, that's not as much of a limitation. You can kind of choose to have as many kids as you want. You're not necessarily limited by resources or by how much money you have. Um, so whereas, you know, in a, in a lesser developed country, you might get to a point and say, you know, I've had one kid and that's all we can afford, um, you know, Perhaps you want to have more kids, and if that's financially viable, there would be lots of couples who would choose to do that. So in very high um, HDI countries, countries that score really high in HDI, there's a, there is evidence that that trend reverses, and birth rates may increase again. There's also the argument that this is a Eurocentric model. And again, as we saw, it's based on the development of Western European countries. And we can see why this might be an issue. It implies that all countries can and should evolve in the same way that Western European countries did. And again, as we've seen before, um, there's not always one path to progress. There could be other ones. So this may be limiting our scope of how countries may develop. This also only accounts for natural increase. Remember, it's only talking about birth rates and death rates. It doesn't consider the effects of migration. And as we talked about with stage five, um, immigration or emigration can play a huge role in demographics as well and the issues that may come out of that. And finally, it also doesn't account for major events that can rapidly instigate demographic transition. So for example, pandemics, war, economic collapse, things that might cause your population to shrink really rapidly, um, the demographic transition model doesn't really talk about that. Again, you could have a bunch of stage four countries that all go to war with each other. Think World War I or World War II, these highly developed countries, and then the death rate's going to skyrocket as a result, or a, a superbug is going around killing millions of people. These are unexpected events that could you know, devastate uh, a population. The, the model doesn't say anything about that. Or the reverse. If we were to discover some really cheap, renewable, plentiful form of energy that, you know, we were living in a post-scarcity society, we didn't have to worry about providing for, you know, future generations anymore, just, you know, energy and resources were abundant, um, that would let us support a much higher population than we have today. So again, the demographic transition model doesn't really talk about that. Um, it's kind of looking at, you know, thinking about the way the world has been the past couple hundred years and trying to apply that going forward. And so in summary, the demographic transition model is a tool used to describe the pattern in which populations evolve over time. Populations tend to start off with high birth and death rates, but when they begin to gain access to better medicine and sanitation, their populations expand rapidly. Once infant mortality rates are low and contraception is available, birth rates fall and the population becomes stable. In some countries, birth rates have continued to drop below death rates, leading to a shrinking population. As more countries progress through the stages of demographic transition, world population growth will likely level off sometime this century. And although the model is good for examining the development trajectories of countries, it is not wholly predictive and has some shortcomings.